evening, everyone, and welcome to the Neshoba Valley Technical High School School Committee meeting, uh, November 8, 2020. Joanna, could we have a roll call, please? Here. Here. Mr. Here. 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 All set? Seeing that we have a quorum, I'll call the meeting to order. Would you all please join me in our Pledge of Allegiance to the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. At this time, uh, I'd like to call for a minute of silence in memory of Don here. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Uh, rec uh, public com yeah. Public comments on the agenda are limited to three minutes. They must address agenda items only. Time allotments cannot be shared with other individuals. Any agenda item that someone would like to have placed on the agenda, you can contact me through our webpage. My information is there if you're interested in having something on the agenda. <clears throat> with that said, I think we'll run right into student reports. How's that? Stepping ahead of you, Jeremy, sorry. Who would like to go first? All right, so today I'm going to be talking about athletics. So for the boys freshman football team, they've had one win and three losses so far. For the boys junior varsity football team, they've had two wins and one loss. And for the boys varsity football team, they've had four wins and one loss. For the boys, Varsity track team that's outdoors. So far, they've only been to one game against Lynn Vocational Technical Institute, and unfortunately, they lost 23 to 32. And for the sports programs that have ended for the season, the varsity golf team has had six wins and seven losses. For the girls varsity volleyball team, they've had two wins and 16 losses. For the girls junior varsity football, or sorry, volleyball, they've had two wins and 13 losses. For the girls varsity soccer team, they had a really great year. They had 17 wins, two losses, and one tie. And they actually made it to the semifinals, and they've had an amazing year. I know quite a few of the girls on the team, and they were absolutely stoked about this, and I'm very happy for them. As for the boys' varsity soccer team, they had a really good year, too. Um, and actually, one of the players is sitting beside me. They had nine wins, nine losses, and two ties. And they went to the prelim preliminary tournament and unfortunately lost. But overall, both of the teams had a great year. Great, thank you. All right. um, the Student Council is raising a Thanksgiving fundraiser for NT families that are having trouble affording a Thanksgiving meal. So on Thursday, we're going down to Market Basket and picking up some frozen turkeys and other things for them. Uh, and the electrical shop today had a field trip to the IBW in uh, Dorchester, and they got to tour the, the, the location, the Union Hall, and the training program, and where they train all the apprentices. It was a really cool experience. We enjoyed it a lot. Awesome. 
right, I'm going to be talking about senior fundraising right now. Uh, we have a Snap Raise fundraiser going on. We've, it's been going on for quite some time now. We recommended that each senior raise at least $100. That was our goal, and we had a like main goal of $5,000 total. We have two days left, and we are very close to reaching our goal. We're at $4,000, $4,110 right now. Um, we have a bunch of other fundraising ideas. We have Google Forms on our Google Classroom for suggestions. And right now, we have a possible bake sale that might be happening. So um, we're trying to put together a bunch of different fundraising to lower costs for our senior week and for like prom tickets and stuff like that so we can have a really fun senior week, have a bunch of different fun activities for us, and also have a good prom at a low cost per ticket. Great, right. thank you. Mr. Chairman, if I may, I just want to share that I did receive an email from Harrison Mayotte, one of our student reps that couldn't be here this evening. He's actually participating in his public service internship in Townsend this evening, so he is not able to join us. Um, but he did want to share that he attended the student representative conference over the weekend and thought it was excellent and wanted me to share with you that he encourages his fellow student representatives to attend one of those sessions in the future. Thank you. Thank you all very much. I'm actually going to sneak right out. I have cheer practice going on. If you don't mind, I'm going to sneak right out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're all set, folks. I mean, you can stay as usual. I appreciate the time you put into it for us. It's, it's great to have you here with us so that we hear from the students. <coughs> Thank so you very you much, it. everyone. You can leave if you want, and you can stay. Oh, yeah. Jeremy, please. I do want to add just two quick items um, to what was said. One is that for the girls' soccer team, that was the, when they won their first round game in the state tournament, that was the first soccer victory that we've had in the state tournament in the history of the school. So that was amazing to hear. And then secondly, um, Mr. Baker, who helped organize that trip to the IBEW, is also taking a large group of um, students to a Girls and Trades conference tomorrow. Um, in fact, he actually had so many students uh, interested in going that they actually had to tell him he could not take everyone, unfortunately, since they had already filled up the conference. So we told him next year to, to reserve twice as many flights as for us because we're going to do the same thing again next year. Awesome. awesome. Nice. All right, so it is my honor to be able to talk about our uh, employee and students of the month and athletes of the month. Um, unfortunately, only one of them is with us tonight, um, so I'm going to start with him because he deserves it for being here. And that is Samuel Husketh. Sam, come on up. So Sam is from Westford. He is on our cross country team. He is only a sophomore. Uh, you may recognize him. He was also here being honored last year as well uh, because he is that much of a standout. He is a straight A student in our carpentry program. Uh, they had their uh, CAC league meet, uh, I believe it was last week, right? And Sam uh, medaled in that meet and qualified for districts, which he will be running in next week. And uh, Mr. Sullivan, who is the cross country coach, absolutely gushed over him and said that, that anything that he asked Sam to do, Sam does, and then asks what else he can do to, to improve and be even better, and it is a strong leader on the team. He's a great role model for others, and, and is just a, a fantastic athlete and a fantastic student, and I wish we had 750 of him at our school, to be perfectly honest, because he's that amazing. So Sam, who'd you bring with you tonight? Uh, I brought my dad, Dave Huskett. Excellent, so congratulations. <laughs> And, and do you do any other sports? Do you participate in other things here at Neshoba Tech? Uh, I do winter track and field and spring track and field. Excellent. Lots of running. I was a runner myself. Uh, as by my waistline, you can probably tell I don't run much anymore, but I used to run a lot. And great sport to be in for a lifetime. So keep up the good work. You're very welcome. Um, so I, I will briefly mention our other honorees. Um, our other athlete of the month was Julia Chamberlain. She's the captain of the girls cross country team. A uh, wonderful young lady, also a straight A student in health assisting. Um, our students of the month are Gilberto Figueroa. Uh, he is in auto body and actually Dr. Pigeon nominated him. Um, she saw a student who I believe had dropped their lunch and was struggling with, am I getting this right? Struggled with how to get their lunch afterwards. 
It was a new student. Um, I went into the cafeteria. It was a new student, and he was working alongside a new student who was definitely nervous navigating the lunch line. And he was just absolutely wonderful and supportive in making sure that the student knew how to go through the line, select the different portions of the lunch. And, and I personally believe that if he hadn't done that or hadn't gone above and beyond, that that student might not have eaten lunch that day. So um, it really brightened my day, and that's why I nominated him. And, and Gil is a terrific young man. As I said, he's an auto body, and uh, auto body teachers tell me what a hard worker he is. He's actually not here tonight because he's working. He also works at a restaurant in Chelmsford. Um, so he, he's, he's a great young man. And they, in a similar way, talked about how when a couple of new kids came into the shop last year, he took them under his wing and helped them get acclimated to the shop, just like what you're talking about with that new student in the lunch line. So that is Gilberto. And then our other student of the month is Katerina Silva. So as you know, this month we've had a, a quite a number of eighth grade tours coming to us from our area schools. Um, and uh, at one of those tours, there was a young lady who came along who spoke very little English. Portuguese was her primary language. And our current student, Katarina Silva, who uh, speaks uh, Portuguese, actually accompanied her on that tour and helped basically to interpret uh, what was happening throughout the tour for her. Uh, so she certainly was respectful and took responsibility for that other student, and we really applaud her for that. Um, her shop teachers say that, that she's wonderful. She's in veterinary assisting, and, and they specifically talked about being at Strongwater Farm. And uh, if you knew Katerina, you'd realize she, she's very slight of stature, and um, I guess she's in there um, cleaning the paddocks and the stalls, um, and her size does not uh, affect her ability to do that at all. She's just a hard worker and uh, gets as much done as anyone regardless of, of her stature. So they went on and on about her regarding that as well. Um, and then lastly, Mr. DeSantis is our employee of the month. Um, and he actually had three nominations. Uh, one was from, he is a mentor to one of our new teachers, Elizabeth Montero, who just said how he stops by to check on her every single day and has been so helpful with her questions and getting her uh, acclimated to the school. Um, also, uh, Mr. Sullivan nominated him as well for his work with students, and Brianna, who just left a short time ago, uh, needed help with her college applications and um, her uh, resume writing and her recommend getting her recommendations together. And he uh, went down to the shop to work with her on those to make sure that she was able to get her college applications in. Uh, so she wanted to nominate him for that as well. So five very helpful people, great role models that we are proud to call our own here at Neshoba Tech. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> this evening we are going to be filming the presentations of our auditor and also our treasurer's annual report. It's something that we agreed to before COVID came, came so strong. We haven't done it for a while, so this is our first uh, venture back into this. So Michelle Shepard, our business manager, would you like to introduce our guest? So tonight's speaker, we have one of the uh, partners of Howes and Sullivan, it's Freddie Soretti. Uh, this is the second year he's been with us. I'll just let him speak. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Thank you for having me here tonight. Just like to start off by thanking the superintendent and the business manager, treasurer, and the rest of the finance team for all the cooperation and assistance that uh, our team received during the course of the audit. Um, we, from a timing standpoint, we're out. Uh, we do the audit in two different phases. So we come out for what we consider to be our preliminary work in uh, mid-June. In that time, we're trying to get as much done as we can to just basically get a head start on the year-end audit work. We're auditing things like debt and the budget, and we're testing transactions, and we're uh, just doing as much as we can. And then we were back out for our, our year-end audit work uh, early August, and we're wrapping up any loose ends we might have had from our preliminary work. We're completing all of our year-end audit procedures, and then we're compiling the audit reports. Uh, I'd like to go through some financial highlights with you, but before I do that, I just want to go through uh, a couple of quick um, required communications. Um, First relates to significant accounting policies, and those are found in note one of the financial statements. 
There were no new accounting policies that were adopted and um, the application of existing accounting policies were all uh, consistent with no changes from the prior year. Accounting estimates um, are an integral part of the financial statements. The most significant estimates relate to uh, the net pension liability, the net OPEB liability, compensated absences, which is your sick and vacation accrual, and also depreciation on fixed assets. And uh, we evaluated the uh, key factors and assumptions related to those estimates, and we found those to be really, uh, reasonable in relation to the financial statements as a whole. Uh, we didn't have any difficulties. We didn't encounter any difficulties in dealing with management and performing the audit. Um, for audit adjustments, um, those are defined as a proposed correction of the financial statements that, in, in our judgment, may not have been detected except through our auditing procedures. And I'm pleased to report that we didn't have to propose any audit adjustments to correct the books and records of the school. We found them to be in uh, good order. Uh, Next is uh, disagreements with management, and that would be a matter whether or not resolved to our satisfaction concerning a financial accounting, reporting, auditing, or other matter that could be significant to the financial statements or the auditor's report. And I'm happy to report that we didn't have any um, of those disagreements uh, as well. So with that out of the way, I'd like to jump into some financial highlights. And the first thing I'd like to talk about is the general fund fund balance, and you can find that on page 14 of the audited financial statements. Uh, the general fund fund balance totaled $3.5 million. Of that, $1.7 million was restricted. And of the restricted amount, $1.6 million relates to your capital stabilization fund, and $100,000 relates to your compensated absences reserve. You also had 1.1 million of assigned fund balance, and of that, 293,000 relates to encumbrances, and another 780,000 relates to excess and deficiency that was voted uh, to fund the FY23 budget. That left you with unassigned fund balance of $692,000. That's about 4% of your operating budget, and that number normally approximates your E&D. It's the starting point for your E&D calculation. And the E&D is limited to 5% of your next year's budget. Anything in excess of that has to be returned to the member communities. Next thing I'd like to talk about is the uh, general fund operating results. And those can be found on page 49 of the financial statements. The results uh, of operations uh, resulted in an increase of $8,500 in fund balance for the general fund. Your revenues exceeded your budget by $109,000. Uh, state aid transportation exceeded the budget by 44000 and then miscellaneous income and investment income, which aren't budgeted, totaled uh, $65,000. <coughs> Your expenditures uh, were 582000 less than budgeted. The main uh, line items related to that were regular and vocational instruction for 198000 pupil services for 176000 and operations and maintenance for 76,000. So those things all increased your, your fund balance and then uh, they were offset by a decrease of 647,000 which is related to uh, E&D that was used to balance the budget. Um, the results, your budgetary results indicate to us that your budget was well planned out and that your controls of your, your budgetary controls are working effectively. You essentially broke even in your general fund, which I think is what you were um, trying to do. Next thing I'd like to talk about is the school choice fund, and that can be found on page 16 of the financial statements. Fund balance total $2.1 million at June 30th. Uh, you received $316,000 in uh, tuition payments, and you had payments of $568,000 out of the fund for instructional costs. And those funds are available for expenditure by the school committee without further appropriation. Uh, other items, uh, debt, you didn't issue any new long-term debt during the year. Your long-term debt totaled $2.9 million and you paid down $520,000 of debt principal payments. Uh, you had no short-term debt outstanding. Your other post-employment benefits liability uh, increased by $81,000, so that's a pretty nominal increase and totaled $8.5 million. Your discount rate increased from 5% to 5.38%, and that's mainly due to um, the change in the municipal bond rate, which is um, something that you're, 
your discount rate is based on. The OPEB liability was 15% funded, which is in line with what it was last year. You contributed another $300,000 to the OPEB trust, and the net position of the trust totaled $1.5 million, which was consistent with the prior year. The reason you didn't really see <coughs> excuse me, an increase is that you had a net investment loss of $221,000. And that's consistent with what we're seeing in other communities, just with the current market conditions for that period of time. As far as your net pension liability goes, um, teachers and certain administrators are part of the Mass Teachers Retirement System. That liability is um, paid for by the Commonwealth <clears throat> in total $22.2 million. The Commonwealth made uh, $1.8 million worth of payments on behalf of the district. <clears throat> and then the remaining uh, individuals that aren't, don't qualify to be in the Mass Teachers Retirement System are part of the Middlesex Contributory Retirement System. The liability um, associated with the school with Middlesex was $3.4 million. That was a $212,000 increase from the prior year. Middlesex is about <coughs> 61% funded, excuse me, <coughs> and uh, the prior year was 53%, and the discount rate was lowered from 7.3% to 7.15%, and that has the effect of increasing the liability. So in summary, we were able to issue an unmodified opinion on the financial statements. That's a clean opinion. Uh, that's the best opinion you can get. It means your financial statements are fairly stated in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. Um, your financial performance indicates a sound budget process and effective budgetary controls. Reporting deadlines were met. Information that we received was accurate. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, no internal control uh, deficiencies were noted during the course of the audit. And all of our interactions, as I mentioned, were professional and courteous, which we appreciate. So those were really the things I wanted to highlight with the financial statement audit. You also received um, a report on federal awards. Uh, that report is required for, <coughs> for uh, entities expending more than $750,000 in federal funds in a fiscal year. You expended $1.2 497,000 of that was for the child nutrition program, 299,000 for special education, 179 for COVID relief, and 225,000 for other federal funds. <coughs> Based on the testing that we did, we had no findings, we had no question costs, uh, no deficiencies in internal controls, and we were able to issue an unmodified opinion on compliance, which again is the best opinion that you can get. So that was a clean report. <coughs> is what you would hope for. Last report is the management letter. Um, <coughs> it's critical in nature. It doesn't highlight the things that you do well. <coughs> but what's important to note is that there are no material weaknesses and no significant deficiencies reported in that report. We did have one finding that carried over from the prior year in purchase orders. And um, the issue there is that in our testing, we're noting purchase orders that are date after, dated after the invoice dates, and that kind of defeats the purpose of what the purchase orders are designed to do. They're essentially designed to make sure that you have uh, sufficient funds available when appropriation is made <coughs> to make sure that the um, appropriation has been procured in accordance with mass general laws and that the proper um, approvals have been made, the sign-offs and everything. So I know that Management is working on a policy now to address that, and we anticipate that that will be addressed um, <coughs> in the next year. I apologize for my cough. I'm uh, just getting over something and uh, doing the best I can. <laughs> and uh, so that's the, uh, the end of my presentation. If anybody has any questions, I'm happy to try to take them. Any questions from the board? Claire, any questions? I was just wondering if the student activity fund has been completed and issued? Yes, it has. Okay. Anyone else? No? If I may. Please. Through the chair. Uh, the, I understand that the management letter only focuses on 
Consider to be a significant deficiency or material weakness. So it's not something that was um, required to be put in writing um, and something that we would be required to share with you like prior to this meeting. Um, so it, yeah, it's more of bringing something to your attention where there's an area, there's some room for improvement, let's say. Um, and so you have that, you know, control in place and you just want to try to tighten it up a little bit so that not as many things, you know, it's not going to be perfect, but I think you want it to be a little bit better than what it is right now. I think it was about 30% of what we tested was, uh, they were dated after the invoices. So. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Yep. Please. It's for you to, uh, a lot to wait through. Uh, my compliments to your thoroughness. Uh, kind of following up on uh, what was previously said, just in simple terms, because uh, we need to explain to our constituents and the people that are tuning into this, I think, we want to know in general. If you have to describe the soundness of our institution in a sentence or a few words, what, what words would you use? What's the overall impression you have supported by all these documents? of uh, the financial stability, if you will, of the Shoreway Tech and the competence uh, of its administration and the soundness of uh, its finances? Um, well, my impression just dealing with the team is that you have a very competent professional team in place that do a really great job, as I kind of mentioned up front. We didn't have to propose any adjustments to correct any balances on your, on your uh, ledgers so that you're your ledgers are being maintained properly. Um, you're, you know, following your your policies and procedures, like the transactions that we tested. The only issue that we found was with um, the purchase order dates, and to be honest, that's something that is not that uncommon. Uh, but we do bring it up when we see it. But as far as like the other transactions that we tested, we found that the things were. Uh, being processed in accordance with your policies and procedures and you know par proper approvals and all that stuff. Um, one of the things we always look really closely at is cash reconciliations. As auditors, that's one of the most important areas that's most susceptible to risk. And so we want to see that there's good cash reconciliation procedures in place, that cash is being reconciled on a timely basis, that we can verify all of the, the reconciling items and that they make sense. And we found that to be the case, that you have good controls over cash, so that's always a really good thing to see. Um, <coughs> from a financial standpoint, um, I think based on the way you budgeted, that your budget was controlled, and that you came in, you don't have, your surplus was about 4%, and you're only allowed to have five, and so you seem to consistently come in right around the four to five. So that's good budgetary control. You're not. Uh, charging more assessments than you need to um, and ha having to return money back to your member communities. Um, you're basically coming in, I think, right about where you want to be. Um, and that's, you're basically limited to that 5%. Um, you're putting probably more money into OPEB than many of the other school districts. A lot of them are starting to do it, but with the $300,000 that you've been putting in, from what I see, I would say that's kind of on the upper end of what um, school districts are putting in, although more are starting to look at it and contribute more, but you seem to be a little bit further ahead. So that's really good to see. That's a big liability that, um, you know, I think it's prudent to fund that. And so and that's my impression. I don't know if I left anything out, but does that help? So would you agree what I just heard was that you were sound, stable, and well worn? Would you yes, I would. Those three words? Yep. Could you say them? <laughs> <laughs> Can you look into the camera? <laughs> sure. I think that the, the school is sound and stable and well run. <laughs> Anyone else? Thank you very much. We appreciate it.
My very pleasure. much all your help and support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Now, my pleasure to introduce Mr. Harrison, our treasurer. Would you please uh, give us a little rundown of where we're at, Tim? Please, right from the podium. Appreciate it. myself uh, I'd say the same thing probably every six months I'm here but I try to get here every six months to show my face so you know anyone that's new knows who the treasurer is um, and give you an opportunity to um, give me some feedback any suggestions any questions on the monthly treasurer's report that you get in your packet each month uh, I hand them off um, but I'm not here to address them so here's an opportunity to if anyone has any comments take them. Other than that, um, just wanted to give an update on the OPEB and the stabilization fund. Last time I was here, I think it was March because I gave a report as of February 28th. Um, at that time, investments were still doing very well. We had a good amount of earnings in both. I talked about, um, especially the OPEB, you know, how many years that the earnings uh, since inception, it was, it was covering uh, retiree premiums. Um, everything looked nice and rosy. Well, mm -hmm. as we all know, things change. Mm -hmm. They change fast. So that's the bad news is that we've lost a lot of that money. Um, in fact, the stabilization fund has since from February 28th to September 30th, it's actually lost $77,412. And the OPEB has lost $244,962. The difference between the two is, under Mass General Law, your stabilization funds are, have to be invested on a conservative basis. There's, there's certain things that you're limited to investing, so that did limit your losses, where the OPEB is invested for long term. You're not looking at one year. Um, so yes, we lost a lot of money, but we, over the long period, we will we'll make that back. In fact, we had an OPEB meeting on October 26th. Bartholomew and Company came out, did their presentation. They did a very good job, as they usually do. And their recommendation was to stay the course. And in fact, they recommended being a little bit more aggressive at this time, um, consistent with what other uh, municipalities are doing in the Commonwealth. Um, so we're actually at a 70-30. Um, it's 70% uh, stocks, 30% bonds, um, and in that 70% uh, 70, 70 we do have some alternatives which are actually doing uh, still all right during this market uh, downturn. Uh, those alternatives I have a lot of real estate, uh, mostly commercial, uh, not residential. Um, the good news also is that even though we have lost significant amount of money in this six month, seven month period, we still have not, um, since inception, we still have not lost any of our principal, any of the money that you have used, um, you know, with member town assessments to put into the stabilization, the OPEB trust. We have not, the down market has not uh, eaten into that. We still have a positive net earnings uh, in both of those funds from inception. So. Is that September 30, the OPEB still has a $72,000 net earnings, and the stabilization has a 
126,000 net earnings. So we're still positive. We haven't lost any of our principal. It's all, all good news. Um, and hopefully it's all going to turn around shortly and start earning money again. That's pretty much all I wanted to say. Anyone have any questions for me? Any questions? Clear, please. I'd be interested, um, as the district tries to plan long-term for capital needs, I'd be interested in any views you might have on, you know, we just got news last week, for example, that the state has pulled back on the repair program where they match money for roofs and windows. Um, and we're in the midst of, a, you know, working with the architects to get a real assessment of all the needs in the building because it's been so long since the building project happened. Um, and even though they tell us everything's really well maintained, there are areas that we're trying to slot out and plan over the next maybe 10, 15 years, which would obviously end up involving some way of funding them, partially through bonding, I would think. And so what I'm interested in is um, if you have views about how we can best utilize the stabilization fund and whether uh, there are ways to increase it on a regular basis with a view to helping with the capital planning needs. Good question. Um, I like leaving the stabilization fund alone and not looking at that as a way to fund projects. I think it's a good way to maintain stability, maintain your bond rating, should you have to borrow in addition to using any of your own money. Um, the town I live in, about 10 years ago, we created a capital stabilization fund. We initially funded it with a general override and then each year that amount is raised on the tax so that same amount gets put into that stabilization fund every year plus a two and a half percent increase which is allowed by law and we've used that uh, well, on projects we needed to borrow for uh, other than buildings and say we we're buying a fire truck for eight hundred thousand dollars we might borrow on short-term notes and just pay for it out of that stabilization fund uh, we're at a point now where um, that fund is we're, we haven't borrowed in a couple of years. We're not anticipating that fund will be up to about a million and a half in a year from now. And now we're looking at the possibility if, you know, now if we get into a building, say, uh, you know, our next need is a highway facility, um, we may be able to borrow $8 million and, and not do a debt exclusion and just pay for it out of the capital stabilization fund. So that's one, you know, so that's the, general sta the general stabilization. The general stabilization. We have a general stabilization. We have a capital stabilization. The capital was strictly for capital needs. The general was really just the rainy day. Yeah, and okay. and to you know, when the bonding agencies they look they, they look at for a town anyway they look at your free cash and stabilization together and say that is that is your reserve. So they're looking at your E and D and your stabilization as your reserve, separate from if you had a, a separate capital plan. So what's involved in creating a separate capital stabilization fund? Well, there, I guess there would be two ways of doing it. Well, first you'd have to obviously vote it, um, and then funding it, you either could you could do uh, you know if you get everybody to agree, um, you could do a, an override, or you could just just have an amount appropriated each year. For a while, you were putting money both in the stabilization and OPEB. You got the stabilization to where you want it to be. Now you're putting more in the OPEB, but you could continue to put money in OPEB and now start funding a capital stabilization fund. Getting into budget cycle, so thank you for your yeah. input. Through the chair. Yes, please. We're, we're we're living in interesting financial times, to say the least. Can you give us a, a little guidance? I know you don't have a crystal ball, but um, I'd like to know, I'm sure my 
uh, committee members would. Uh, I'm sure there are pluses and minuses uh, in the actions of the Fed recently in changing of the discount rate for crime. And um, I, I trust that you're poised to take advantage of these changes. Can you give us just a, uh, a brief overview of what's better for us and what's not so much better for us as we watch uh, the crime continue to rise? Um, sorry, better in what way? Your, your investments or? Yeah, just overall, I know that uh, some things will get better and some things will get worse, and it would be nice to be able to focus on where we need to be more. It's a tough one. It's a pretty tall question. Uh, you know, I, I don't have a crystal ball, and I'm not really tuned into what the Fed does. Um, you know, I still think if. You know, if you're looking long term, investing, you know, is still a good idea. I wouldn't pull back. Um, you know, I don't know how all your, the individual member towns are doing. You know, the state's doing great. They're giving money back. Um, you know, my own town, we're still doing fine. You know, we're not feeling the, the crunch. You know, our meals tax and, is still doing very well. Um, so the revenues are coming in, you know, we're not, our receivables are not growing, so, yeah, I know, you know, the economy is not great and prices are going up, but people are still spending money. We're not, and we're not seeing the effects of it. I know it's going to, should we need to, it's going to cost us more money tomorrow. On the other hand, we'll be earning more money on our investments. Right. So, I mean, that's even, you know, if you're, the interest rates are going up, that's even more important to keep your stabilization, not to touch it if you don't have to, keep your surplus, you know, close to the 5%, you know, show that you've got a strong available reserves, which will help decrease your, your if you have to borrow, it decreases your interest rates. Well, I think that that's part of the advice I was hoping to hear because as we just heard from the auditor, we're under where we could be with stabilization. It sounds like we should be um, certainly strengthening that fund and uh, getting closer to the 5% to um, guard against negative contingencies. I would guess the less we might need to borrow, the better and we may be able to take advantage of a strategy that you mentioned. So, Keep the stabilization, do some short term. I mean, I apologize for not knowing this answer. Maybe a uh, business manager might know. <laughs> Throw her on the spot. But our, our, I don't know if school districts are allowed to have multiple stabilization funds like a town can. So know. I'll give you an example of what we're doing in my town. We have our general stabilization fund. We have our capital stabilization fund. We created a health insurance stabilization fund to take out some of the peaks, so we, we figure we can maintain at most about an 8% increase a year. If we get a spike because of, you know, some bad experience in a year and all of a sudden our health insurance jumps up 12%, we can draw from a health insurance stabilization fund to cut the peak off. We created a special ed stabilization fund to help, again, with the cost of our district placements, it's going through the roof and all your collaboratives are all looking at a 14% increase in out of district placements coming up. And so again, we created a SPED stabilization fund in order to help ride some of the, these increases out. Um, so we're, we've been creative trying to create these pools of money to help ride out any potential bad times, you know, different areas. That's, that's exactly what I wanted to hear and the way that you said it because again, we have a number of sending communities, each of which has their own unique financial positions and problems. And um, I know I've always thought that uh, the way we've been managing any excess isn't really an excess. It's, as you pointed out, it's a stabilization fund for capital, it's a stabilization fund for healthcare, and it appears 
that by managing those funds and keeping those uh, those funds, rather than it being a surplus, it's money to do exactly what you described, to even up the peaks and the valleys so that uh, we don't find ourselves in a position to need to borrow or be deficient. Uh, I mean, would you agree with, obviously that's your strategy and it should be our strategy, is that correct? Yes. You know, we created the, the special ed stabilization so that if a, you know, example if a new student moves into town and is is a residential placement that's two hundred thousand a year and all of a sudden you know the school's like where are we gonna get this money are we gonna have to lay off teachers we're, we're gonna cut and it was like, we'll help you through that we set up this fund we'll take care of these things that that happen after the budgets are all set and, and you're into the, your school year we'll take care of it that way you don't have to worry about it once again, I, I want to come into the business office, the administration, and the treasurer because I think that uh, that's a very sound fiscal policy. And I think it's um, why we're not facing crises where we look at needing to lay off staff or post programs. We're able to write up these ups and downs. So I hope it continues that way. Thank you, Sam. Uh, I just want to have one question before you leave, and, and I know in the past you've always associated a percentage point with the stabilization fund. Is that percentage point moved? I think it was like 10% of your budget should be stabilization. I think we always talked about 8%. 8, okay. <laughs> and, I, and I apologize, I didn't make that calculation I should have before I came to see where we are, if we're still on target or not. I just want to make sure that that did, percentage point didn't move. Alicia, please. Um, so through the chair, there, uh, the special education reserve fund came up at the conference this past week, and the town that I was originally on, the school committee for Westford does have one. They did caution, though, that school committees can vote money into those into those reserve funds, but to get them back out, all member towns have to vote to get them back out. So you have to get all of your, all eight, select boards to agree to let you take that money back out of that reserve account. I also just want to point out that that particular type of stabilization account is not really applicable to vocational schools because we, when a student is outplaced um, through the through the special education process, they they are they do go back to their sending town and then their sending town places them in the outside placement. So that particular fund is not applicable to vocational schools. But a capital, a capital fund may be. We just don't, I'm not sure now, and I, I'm not sure if we have that information. We'll, something we have to look into is the possibility of establishing that. I know that we'll, we'll talk about it at our next budget subcommittee meeting as well, but it's also my understanding that there's only one type of stabilization account that vocational schools can create, and that is, in fact, the one that we already have. Um, but I will double check and add it to the agenda for the next budget subcommittee. But if that's the case, then I would say start putting money back in more start putting money in the, in the general stabilization projects. again to fund capital projects thank you you know kind of look at it yeah it's one fund oh. but but it, it on in your mind you're separating the two pieces my eight percent that i want to keep and then mm -hmm. the excess is for for capital okay. Mr. any Mr. other Chairman, questions please Larry. Larry. yes uh, the answer at the moment is about nine point Seven percent. Anyone else have a question for Tim? No. Tim, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate your support on OPEP and thank all you. that you do for the district. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good seeing everybody again. Good night. Um, we could if you'd like. Should we take a recess so we can stop the cameras there? That's up to you. Okay. Why don't we take a, about a five minute recess so that we have a chance for our students to, to uh, break down and then we'll come back in the session and continue the meeting with the reports. Declare a recess for five minutes. <laughs>